Friday service this year. I want to just take opportunity to thank all that made that possible. The dramatic reading and narration of the Passion of the Christ as told by John chapter 18 and 19, the Gospel of John. I want to thank uh, publicly Devon White, Brian Heckman. I want to thank Amy Failer for the work in media and tech support. Pastor Greg for his work that night. If you are here, you understand that. If you are not here, I do believe that it is posted on our uh, on our website or on our YouTube channel, so you can go back and take an opportunity to view the gospel uh, as told by John. That was phenomenal, so I encourage you to do so. But what a great night we had. But here we are. It's Sunday morning. It's the celebration time, isn't it? It's the most significant day of the year as we celebrate uh, those who have identified with Christ as a Christ follower we celebrate and accept the gift of life through Jesus' death, burial, and most importantly, his resurrection. You know, it's the most significant event the world has ever known. We continue yearly, annually. In fact, really, quite frankly, every day of our lives, we celebrate what Christ has done in us, right? You know, it's kind of interesting, you know, when I think oftentimes and celebrate Easter or Resurrection Sunday, as many of us call that, when I think about that, certain images pop into my head. And I know that's probably true for you as well. One of those would be to my left, your right, we look at the wall and we see the what? Depiction of the cross. And uh, the cross is something that we often assimilate to and think about when we think about Easter, and rightfully so. In fact, when I think about the cross, I don't know about you, but I think about a price that had to be paid. I think about the word sacrifice when I think of the cross. We understand that according to Scripture, that a sacrifice had to be made. And in this case, Christ came to become the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. This the writer of John said when he looked upon Jesus. But the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 9.22, that without the shedding of blood, that there would be what? No remission of sin. In many years and over the years, songs have been written, hymns have been penned that talk about the cross. I want to take you a little bit, uh, uh, for many of us, I want to take you a little bit on memory lane, a trip down memory lane a little bit this morning. When we think about the cross in songs that have been written, kind of will date you. You'll know a little bit when you were born if you know the lyrics to some of these songs. Uh, I think about a song that goes like this. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the Ah, some of you have been there before. And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by, I received my, and now I'm happy all the days. Those of you who have been born in the last 25 years, you go Google that. Yeah. Song about the cross, the place of sacrifice, the place of surrender. Or how about this one? On a hill far away stood an, Old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Yeah, it's the image of Easter. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the place of sacrifice. We also think, and I, I think of an image that plays out in my head, of what? We don't want to leave Jesus on the cross. He didn't stay there. He, he did die. He did give up his life. He breathed his left breast. He, he made this statement, it is finished. Then ultimately he was taken from the cross. He was wrapped in burial clothes and he was laid in a tomb. So we have an image, most importantly of Easter Sunday, is the image of what? The empty tomb and if the cross represents price or sacrifice, the tomb represents what? Victory. Victory in Jesus. Uh, it's Christ's victory over sin and death in our lives. You know, oftentimes, you know, in my quiet time, and, and when I spend time with the Lord and in the Word, and, and uh, I like to journal and write, but oftentimes the Lord would just kind of, on any given moment, drop a song into my heart. When I thought about the empty tomb, now this one's not so old, uh, but this one was a song that was written by an artist, a Christian artist, who is by the name simply of Carmen. Anybody remember Carmen? We have a few Carmen fans in the house. And Carmen's songs at times were intense. And, and, and they weren't just songs. They, were, they, they told a story. 
And uh, in fact, a lot of his songs you could actually do, and we did over the years, we would do a skit. We would gather the youth or the young adults, and we would put together a skit to tell a story. And this one we've actually done on Easter Sunday, and it's called what? Sunday's on the Way. Anybody hear that song? Sunday's on the Way? And uh, I love this, and I began to think about this this week in my preparation. And this is such a cool story. And uh, we've acted this out. Some of you sitting in the sanctuary as adults today were a part of that when you were younger. And uh, in the story, of course, we know that there's this ongoing battle between Satan and Jesus. And uh, there's a moment in, in the, the program and in the song where Jesus is crucified and he goes into the grave, right? And I think about this. Uh, Satan begins to, and this is where I love what can, Carmen can kind of do to paint a picture for you and I. There all of a sudden becomes this perceived victory by Satan and his demons, and they begin to have what? They begin to have a party. They begin to celebrate. So there's this celebration going on because Christ was crucified. He's in the tomb. We have a tomb up here, and it's all on the side, and we've got different parts of our youth that are playing different roles, and uh, he's, uh, Satan and his demons are having a big party, but then uh, they've partied all night Saturday night. They've had a great time cheering and celebrating this victory that they've had, and then the sun begins to rise on Sunday morning. Anybody relate to this? And, and, and suddenly, and, and with the, the, the music and, and the lyrics, the, the, the stone begins to what shake. And, and suddenly, the stone begins to slowly roll away. And then at the last moment, as Satan is crying, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, Hope Stay Camper steps out of the tomb, and she's this tall. She's a giant angel. And the crowd goes bananas because what? The grave is empty. Satan's been defeated. I'm glad somebody's excited about that. So the empty tomb represents victory for you and I. For once and for all, it happened on the cross. It was completed when Jesus rose again. These are images we all have of Easter as we celebrate. But I want to share to you today, just to put another image in your mind, one that's had a profound impact on me. And it's the image of a veil in the temple. That at that moment, when Jesus said these words, it is finished, and he bowed his head, a veil in the temple was torn in two. Yeah. The Passion of the Christ told in the four Gospels. I'm going to pick up a little bit of the story from Mark chapter 15 for just a moment. I'd like you to read along with me as Mark tells the story. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until about 3. At 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you abandoned or forsaken me? And some of the bystanders misunderstood, and they thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. And one of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and holding it up to him on a reed stick so that he could drink it. But wait, let's see whether Elijah comes down to take him down. And Jesus uttered another loud cry and at that moment breathed his last breath. And the curtain or the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed at that moment, this man truly was the Son of God. I remember in 2004, the Passion of the Christ was released. Mel Gibson and his version of the Passion. Uh, I'm sure many of us saw that. Uh, my wife has seen portions of, of that over the years, like this. She watches... When we've watched that film, she watches it through her hand and her fingers because she just can't bear to see the suffering of Christ. But in the Passion of the Christ, there's this moment that to me has just left an imprint on my heart. If you'll remember in the story, Jesus has been beaten, crown of thorns on his head. He's on the cross. He understands the assignment. He's fulfilling all that God had asked him to do. He's on that cross, and he utters that word, those words, it is finished, 
and breathe his last breath. Go back with me for just a moment to the movie, and you see a scene depicted then of a single teardrop coming to earth from heaven. The father's heart as he grieves the loss of his son. And that tear travels through the atmosphere and finds its place on Golgotha. As that tear hits the ground, the earth begins to shake. And we see then the veil of the temple being torn in two from top to bottom. Why the veil? What does that represent? What does that even mean for you and I today? Well, I think for us to understand this, we have to understand some things about the effect of sin and the nature of God. I will tell you that sin separates us, doesn't it? Sin at its very core is disobedient to the things of God, and it's intended to, as Jesus describes, steal, kill, and destroy. It's the motivation of Satan, the arch enemy of God, is to kill and destroy and eliminate your relationship with the Heavenly Father, your Creator. Think about this for a moment. Take you back to the book of Genesis. God creates mankind. He breathes the breath of life into him. He's created man to be in relationship, to have fellowship and communion with him. He creates a garden. It's perfection. Puts him in the garden, and he gives him access to everything in the garden. He says, you may eat of any tree in the garden except the one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in that day that you eat of that tree, you will what? You will surely die. Sin kills. Sin separates and sin destroys. So Adam and Eve live in the garden. They tend to the garden. They have fellowship and communion with the Father on a daily basis. And yet we get to Genesis chapter 3. Satan comes in and he sows some deceit. He whispers into Eve's ear. God really didn't mean that. He knows that in the day you take of that fruit or you eat of that tree, you will become like him. And deceit entered into the heart of Eve, and she shared that with Adam, and they ate of the fruit. And in that moment, disobedience through their sin and their disobedience, God comes in and there is a separation between Adam and Eve and their creator. He drives them from the garden. He places an angel to guard and protect the garden. And now he begins to what? Immediately began to cultivate a means and a way of of sacrifice and forgiveness to restore that relationship. To understand the veil, we have to understand that sin puts a barrier between us and God. We also have to understand the very nature of God. Why is that? Well, God is holy. God is perfect. He is pure, he is righteous, he is true. And from the very framework, the beginning of the creation of the world, he has a method and a way by which he wants to react and interact with you and I. He has a standard he wants us to approach him with. And writer of Hebrews gives us clarity with this. He said in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it's impossible to what? Please him. You cannot please God without faith. And for me, and if you've been at Bethel Life more than a minute, you've heard me say this, that faith in God, for me, the simplest definition is complete obedience. God, I want to walk next to you. I want to live with you. I want to obey you. I trust you. I have faith in you. The sin nature now is born into the heart of man, and it continues. We get to Genesis chapter 4, and Adam and Eve give birth to two sons. Their names are... Cain and Abel. Cain is a tiller of the ground. Abel raises sheep. God has a method and way by which we're to worship him, to honor him, to give to him, to return to him. Scripture tells us there that in the course of time, or as time began, that Cain took some of his fruit or his vegetables, his harvest, and presented it to the Lord. But Abel, Abel took the firstborn. Abel made a sacrifice to the Lord, and the Lord was pleased with Abel's sacrifice. But not so with Cain's. And in that moment, sin grabs Cain's heart, and he takes the life of his brother. And again, we see this separation as God drives out Cain. Disobedience is sin, 
and sin works in our lives to destroy our relationship with the one who created us. As we kind of progress down through the Scripture reading and the story of God in Scripture and his relationship with mankind, we see that still in the book of Genesis, he raises up a man and, and forms a covenant with a man named Abraham. And he blesses Abraham. And there's a sacrifice that is made that culminates this relationship. And he creates a man who then he says, I'm going to bless you, Abraham, and through you all nations of the world will be blessed. And we kind of progress through the scriptures. We see now that the descendants of Abraham find themselves in bondage in Egypt, and they've been there far too long. They've adapted to the culture around them. They've become complacent in who they are and what they're called to do, and they stay a little too long. And now they are living in bondage. And after almost 430 years, God hears their hearts cry. He raises up a type of Christ in Moses to bring them out of Egypt and take them to the promised land. And in his heart's desire to have relationship with them, he encourages them to build a tabernacle. And he gives specific instruction. Exodus 26, verses 31 and 33. For inside this tabernacle, make a special curtain of finely woven linen, decorated with blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and with skillfully embroidered cherubim. Hang this curtain on gold hooks, attach it to four posts of acacia wood, overlay the posts with gold, and set them on four silver bases. Hang the inner curtain from the clasp, and put the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it. This curtain will separate the holy place from what? The most holy place. You see, the tabernacle was the place of worship. It was a place where the priest would carry out their duties according to God's law. The most holy place was reserved for the presence of God himself. It was the place of the Ark of the Covenant. It was a place for the, of atonement. It was on the mercy seat where once a year the priest would enter into the most holy place having gone through a, a time of purification and then of blood sacrifice and they would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat for the sins of the people. And this was God's plan. Man could not enter into the presence of God for if they would, they would surely die. And as we progress into the New Testament, we see what has now happened as Christ came to the earth, become the ultimate sacrifice for you and I. We pick up this story in Hebrews chapter 9, re reading from beginning in verse 6. We see this expounded upon just a little bit by the writer of this better covenant. When these things were all in place, the priest would regularly enter the first room, that is the holy place, and they would perform their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people that had been committed in ignorance. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that, listen to these words, the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time for the gifts and the sacrifices the priests offer are not able to cleanse the conscience of people who bring them. In other words, the sacrifice wasn't enough. It was temporary. And therefore, they could not enter into the presence of God. The entrance to the holy place was not freely open. So verse 11 tells us that when Christ came, he became the high priest over all the good things that have come. He entered in that greater and more perfect tabernacle in heaven, that which is not made by human hands or is not part of the created world. And with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once and for all, and he secured our redemption forever. That is why we celebrate Easter Resurrection Sunday. Because Christ, the perfect sacrifice, he went into heaven. He shed his blood for you and I. And where there was once the entrance into God's presence was not free to open today, you and I can come what? Boldly into the throne of grace. Sin separates. God is holy. He's perfect. 
And I would tell you that we celebrate Easter because God has removed the barrier. <laughs> Easter is all about the cross. It's about the blood of Christ. It's about an empty grave. It truly is about how much God loves you. It's an expression of his love for you. For God so loved the world that he what willingly gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. The love that God has for you and I has been manifest. It's proven through redemption. The fact that he has rescued you out of darkness and brought you into his marvelous light. His love is expressed and manifest through forgiveness and reconciliation. He offers us hope for today. He provides relationship and freedom. He loves to commune with us and desires the same from us. In his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus made a way and opened the door for you and I not only to be forgiven, but that we could daily spend time with our Heavenly Father, that you and I could have access to his throne. Hebrews 10, 9, and 22, 19 and 22. So, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter into heaven's host, most holy place because of the blood of Christ. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over the house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with the blood of Christ to make us clean. Our bodies have been washed with pure water. So I want to encourage you on this Resurrection Sunday as we gather and celebrate, let us not forget that there was a price for our sin. And that price has been paid with the perfect sacrifice, the blood of Jesus. Let us celebrate the cross. Let us celebrate the empty tomb because the veil has been removed and you and I today have unlimited access to the throne of our Heavenly Father. It's kind of interesting. We live in a world where that's kind of a phrase that has become very popular, right? No matter where you look, do you have limited access or unlimited access? See, you can get a subscription to anything, but let's just call it, let's say ESPN. There's ESPN and there's ESPN Plus. There's Hulu, and now we know there's Hulu plus, 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 right? What does that tell you? Well, depending on what you pay, you may or may not be able to access the information and the entertainment. There's limited access. Sometimes we treat the grace of God and the blood of Christ as though we still have limited access. We live in fear. We sometimes live in bondage. We feel like we have to pay a, a heavier price. If I'm going to have unlimited access, I haven't paid a, a heavy enough price just yet. Can I remind you what Jesus said on the cross in his final words? He said what? It is finished. This word, it is finished, is a Greek word to tell us die. And it carries the meaning of complete. It is finished. Nothing needs to be added to it. At the time this was written, everyone in the culture understood this term. You see, it was a common term used in the business community for a debt that had been repaid. When the payment was made, the merchant or the lender would write this word to telestai across the receipt, indicating paid in full. I'm here to tell you today that the cross is the image and the picture of sacrifice. The tomb is the image and the picture of victory. The veil that was torn in two paints a picture of unlimited access to the throne room of God. I'm going to ask our worship team to come back to the platform for a moment, but as we close today and prepare to close, I want to say this. We celebrate Easter because sin has been conquered. Death has been defeated, the grave is empty, and Jesus is alive. 
the question that we must ask ourselves today. I'm going to close with two questions for you. Have you accepted this gift of life? Have you surrendered your life to him? And if you have, the question that I have to ask you is, what are you doing with your access to his throne? What are you doing with the privilege of being in his presence? Sin separates. God is holy. You've been forgiven. And you do have access. I read a quote from Rick Warren years ago that just kind of stuck out to me, and I think it applies here. He said, Jesus did not die on the cross just so that we could live comfortably. His purpose is far deeper than that. His desire is to make us like himself before he takes us to heaven. This is our greatest privilege. It is our immediate responsibility. And it is our ultimate destiny. To identify with Jesus, to accept the gift of life, to pursue throughout our lives to become like him in every way. I invite you to stand with me this morning. In a moment, we're going to conclude with a worship song. We're going to celebrate as we should. But I want to pray with you before we do that. Some of you may have willingly acknowledged, you know, I've really never accepted this forgiveness that you talk about, Pastor. I've never acknowledged Jesus as my Lord. I want to pray with you today. Paul writes in Romans 10, he said this, he said, if you would believe in your heart that Jesus was the Son of God, if you believe that he died for your sin and that he rose again, that if you would confess him with your mouth, he said, you would be born again. He would later write this, if anyone has accepted Christ, they've become what? A new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm going to pray with you and for you, and I invite you to pray with me. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, let this be the day that you invite him in. No longer separated from his love. No longer separated from his grace. But bold access into his presence. Father, we thank you for this day. As we celebrate Christ, we celebrate his willingness to go to the cross for each and every one of us, to become the perfect lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Today, Father, we acknowledge Christ as your son. We acknowledge that he went to the cross, he died, and he rose again. Today, we accept Jesus as our Savior we repent of our sin. We repent of our pride. And we invite the Holy Spirit to come and live in us. Thank you for changing me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding me and directing me and helping me in my journey in life to become like Jesus in every way. Father, I pray for those who have accepted Christ. I pray today that we would understand the significance of the veil that was torn in two, that we no longer have to lean on our own understanding, but God, we can trust completely in you. We're not separated from you. We have access to you at any given moment. May we acknowledge that. And Lord, we bless you on this Resurrection Sunday, and thank you for your gift of life. Thank you for your promises. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Following this worship song, our prayer partners will be at the altar. We want to pray for you. If you're here today, you've never accepted Christ, or maybe you just prayed that prayer with me.
we'd like to pray with you at the altar. Maybe you have a need. We'll pray for you today. And then for all of you who are with us today, thank you. We bless you on this Resurrection Sunday. We bless your families. May God's grace be with you. In Jesus' name, amen.